Welcome to Mind Pump, the number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast in the world. We're number one. This is a Q&A episode. This is where we answer questions asked by listeners like you. And this is what went down in this episode. Now, we opened it up with the first 45 minutes being our own introductory conversation where we talk about different topics we'd like to talk about, like uh, fitness and health, or we bring up studies, or we talk about current events. So let me give you the breakdown. We started by talking about knee function. Oftentimes, when you have knee pain, it's due to hip dysfunction or ankle and foot discussion. So we went into uh, a deeper discussion about that type of stuff. Then we talked about Jeff Bezos and his eternal clock. I guess he's building a $45 uh, million dollar clock in a, in a mountain somewhere, Justin said. Yeah. That's kind of weird. It is weird. Then I talked about my high-protein cookie recipe. It was actually pretty good. It's peanut butter chocolate cookies from Organifi, and I used Organifi Plant Protein. It's my favorite protein to use. By the way, Organifi is one of our sponsors. Here's how you get the Mind Pump discount. Just go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump for 20% off. Sal, bring in the cookies. Then I talked about Love and Logic. This is a great course on parenting, and so I gave a little update on how it's working with my kids. We talked about how the retail world is going to be reshaping due to the pandemic. Then we talked about a survey uh, that was done on about 2,000 Americans on how this pandemic is going to affect them on a permanent level. Um, and then we got into the fitness questions. Ooh, here we go. The first question was, what are the best exercises for working the obliques? Next question, this person wants to know how to fix duck feet. This is where your feet turn out when you do exercises or when you walk. The third question this person wants to know why they gained a couple pounds, and yet they look leaner. By the way, they're doing maps anywhere, so this is what's caused that that situation. Mm. Uh, now, of course, it's more muscle. They look leaner because muscle is a little more bit dense of sorcery than body fat. By the way, maps anywhere still on sale. Just use the code white fifty. That's the word white and the number fifty. And the final question in today's episode: This person wants to know how much neat. Is too much. Now, NEAT stands for non exercise activity thermogenesis. So, is there such a thing as doing too much of that that'll impede on the rest of your goals? When NEAT affects your meat and results. Wow. Um, also, these are the final hours for the MAPS Prime and MAPS Prime Pro 50% off sale. Now, MAPS Prime teaches you how to set up your own personalized warm up sessions or what do we like to call priming sessions. Now, why are those important? How you set your body up for your lifts makes a huge difference on um, muscle activation, muscle fiber activation, your range of motion. Essentially, it'll make your workout much more effective. Now, MAPS Prime Pro is all about correctional exercise. So if you have pain, aches, or you want to improve overall mobility, MAPS Prime Pro will help you do that. Now, both programs half off. Here's how you get that 50% off uh, discount uh, within the next few hours of this episode dropping. Just go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code PRIME50. That's P R I M E 50, no space, for the discount. I wanted to address something that, because we've got the, you know, the free webinar, the mobility webinar now that's been, that's been on, and people have gotten a lot of value out of, and out of it. And, you know, Prime and Prime Pro have been on sale. So we've had a lot of people get the program. And there's this one question that keeps popping up. So I want to clarify on the podcast. The question is, what do I do for knees? What oh, do I do for painful knees? What so do I do when my knees yeah, click and you know my knees bother me? Because when you go in MAPS Prime Pro, what you'll find is that we address all the major joints of the body except for the knees. In fact, if you go in there, you will not find knee-specific mobility exercises, but there's a very, very right. important uh, reason for this. And the reason is... That if you have knee problems that are not related to a, a current injury, like in other words, if your knee, if you just hurt your knee mm -hmm. and it's injured, that's different, just like anything else, right? You don't don't do mobility work on something that's just injured. But if it's chronic pain and it's been kind of bothering you for a while, your knee pain is either coming from your hips, in other words, your hips have dysfunction, they're not moving properly, working properly, or it's coming from your feet and ankles. It's not coming from dysfunction in the knee because the knee itself moves. 
It's a it, hinge joint. It, and it moves, well, it, it, it flexes only, and extends, and it, and it and it your hips and ankles and feet d- dictate how well it works. Well, no, right. It's a floating joint. Yeah. It's floating, and it's being held together by all the, the tendons, all the ligaments. ligaments, and fascia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it because it, it that's what makes it unique, it's that this floating joint that you have all these other things that are wrapped and attached. And those other things, the other fascia, tendons, ligaments, the origins and insertions go up to the hip or the ankle. Right. Yeah. So that's what you're addressing is the dysfunction there and Fixing the ankles and the hips will relieve the issues that you're, for the most part, right? There's just there's obviously exceptions to the rule if you have acute injury that you did or whatever. But for chronic pain in the knee, it's almost always, you know, the hip or the ankle or the combination of the two of them that are causing. Yes, that. and this is from a correctional exercise standpoint. Now remember the kneecap, like Adam's saying, the kneecap itself floats, mm-hmm. and when you bend your knee and extend your knee. It travels along like a groove. It's like a track that it travels on. And if that kneecap is being pulled to the right Mm -hmm. or to the left, then you're going to have pain. Now, what pulls it to the right or left? Well, that's the alignment that's caused by your feet, your ankles, or your hips. And if that's off, now you've got kneecap pain. What about the knee joint aside from the kneecap? Well, that joint is being held together and kept in place by all these ligaments, and it it bends or extends. That's it. Bends and extends. Bends and extends. Again, if there's twisting, torsion being placed on that, because your knee joint doesn't twist. It's not like your like your shoulder where I could twist my shoulder joint or your hip that it twists or even your ankle that has a little rotation. Your knee doesn't rotate. It's, it's, it's put in place. There's a little bit of give from the ligaments, mm-hmm. but it's not supposed to have that kind of range of motion. So if it's being twisted by every time you do a lunge or a squat or lots of walking, it's because your hips – or your ankles or your feet are causing the ligaments of the knee to try and stabilize, which not, there's a certain amount of stabilization they should do, but it shouldn't be holding everything together and keeping it in track because your hips, knees, and uh, your hips, ankles, and feet are not working properly. This took me a really long time to like really grasp and understand that uh, as a trainer. It, it would probably be at least five plus years in before I really put this together. Yes. I remember as an early young trainer. If a client complained of knee pain, I would just switch the exercise, right? Because I just didn't I didn't have the tools. I didn't have the tools yet to understand that, oh, okay, the reason why their knee hurts is because they don't have enough knee travel over their ankles because they lack ankle mobility. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. they have extremely tight hips, and then it's pulling on there, or the fascia or IT is really tight and pulling on the knee. Once I understood that and and learned how to help correct that, it was a game changer, you know. And that's and that really is the answer if you're if you're a, a, a listener or you're a potential trainer that is, that's listening right now. When someone complains of knee pain, is that this is where Prime Pro is such a valuable asset? Is you go in there, and this is how I ex- I explained to a lot of people that went to the webinar on how to use this tool is. I put together a little routine and I, I picked like five of my favorite exercises that kind of addressed some of the most common issues I see. But the program has over 55 different movements in there for a reason. And the idea is that you 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 nail down what joint is the, the, the biggest offender, meaning it has the least amount of range of motion and it's causing the most issues in your body and focus on just a couple movements for that joint to really improve its range of motion and drill that home. And there we, we keep getting asked, you know, how often should I do this? When should I do? all the time? Yeah. If you if it's a mobility thing, it's not like strength training. Strength training, there's a protocol of how much you want to do it and how often to make sure you optimize building muscle. When it comes uh, with mobility or working on a range of motion in a joint, you can't do enough of it. So you want to be doing it sporadically all the time to improve that. And so that's the answer. And in the program, we teach you kind of how to program it throughout your routine. But really, the the answer is you take a couple of these moves that that relieve the most pain for you or help you the most with range of motion, and you you practice it all the time. I really liked the visual, like uh, you know, so at one point you had uh, the analogy that uh, of like a sliding glass door, yep. and like how that would go on its track. And so you know, there's two points to that: with the the front of the door, the back of the door, uh, and and so looking at that is the ankle and the hip is, is to guiding, uh, you know, that that sliding glass door just a little bit of a degree off is going to create a lot of friction which is then is going to become a problem and the you know the more it, it gets off track you know that's where we're really going to have the injuries and the things result uh, from that exactly if you're pushing the sliding glass door and you're pushing it you know in one direction as you're sliding it or pulling it in another direction as you're sliding it eventually that track gets worn down and it starts to have problems now you could go in and fix the track 
you know, you could have a, an osteopath go in your knee, scope it, you know, scrape off the parts that, you know, maybe there's some chondromalacia underneath the kneecap or whatever and work on it. And, oh, the knee feels a little better. But if you don't fix the fact that it's getting pulled in one direction or the other from the hips, mm -hmm. ankles, and feet, the pain will continue to reoccur. Even foam rolling, which temporarily will alleviate, for a lot of people, by the way, foam rolling will temporarily alleviate a lot of your pain. It's a temporary fix. It doesn't fix the root cause. Only working on the strength and mobility and connection to the hips, ankles, and feet will do that. By the way, this is true for the elbow too. That's another joint you're not going to see addressed yeah. uh, in, in Maps Prime Pro. The elbow, very similar. If you have elbow pain, now if there's tendonitis that needs to heal, allow it to heal. But nine out of ten times, if there's a problem and pain in your elbows, it's coming from either your wrists, your hands, which is most common, or your shoulders. Oftentimes, it's actually the wrists and hands. In fact, a lot of the times when people's elbows hurt, it's coming from the forearm flexors and extensor, extenders that attach near the elbow. In fact, you could test this yourself. If you have elbow pain, extend your arm, press on the top and the bottom of the elbow where the forearm muscles attach. And if that's sore, mm -hmm. that's a nice little clue. And you can say, oh, wait a minute. This is due to my wrists and my elbow and my hands. And this is why I'm starting to, and they call it, what do they call that? Uh, tennis elbow. Tennis elbow. Or golfer's elbow. elbow too. Oh yeah, totally. So oh. So it's that's what that's how mobility kind of works. Is you want to look and find the root cause. By the way, this is common for a lot of joints. Oftentimes, if you have pain, even in the hips, sometimes it's coming from the feet and the ankles. Sometimes you have pain in the feet, and that may be coming from the hips. So this is why you want to go. You know, if you have a program like Maps Prime Pro, what we did is we put a test under each of these major joints. Pass that test. So follow the test, and then that'll help you identify. Like, oh, I lack mobility here. Maybe that's why I have pain in this other part of my body. It makes a big yeah. difference. Dude, did you guys see? I was just reading. I think it was Popular Mechanics or one of those like scientific uh, type of magazines. And I saw this article about like Jeff Bezos and what he's building uh, for this 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 clock that's supposed to uh, survive like ten thousand years. Huh? Was it an atomic clock or whatever? <laughs> yeah, it's like this. It's like a five hundred foot clock that he built inside a, a mountain, basically, and and it. It, it's powered by all these mechanical gears and everything, but um, I guess like it, it only it only ticks like uh, every so often. I, I don't remember all the details, but it's basically it's like it, it's supposed to survive uh, for uh, I, I don't know like ten thousand years. It's it's, it's crazy. Wow, well, what is the point of that? Though? Well, well, that you're that you want people to in 10,000 years to be like, wow, who did this? You'd be like, yeah, you, you want to kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah you want to show that there's going to be a future uh, beyond this and that uh, like get people to think that there's a lot more, uh, you know, coming up. I Have guess. you guys seen those clocks that are, that are, they use either, uh, I don't know what they use. They, I think they use atomic functions, but they're so accurate, these clocks that they won't be off even by like a, a I don't remember what is like a millionth of a second. Yeah. It'll take them like a billion years or something insane like that. That's how accurate they are. What? Yeah. So, okay. So basically uh, it, it's powered by day night thermal cycles and, what the hell? and synchronized at solar noon. So uh, I don't know. Like this is, I mean, it's just crazy. This, this was thought of by this scientist, Danny Hillis. And, and I guess he came up with this in like 1986. Is like just like a, a sort of a time piece that every like humanity could share, Dude, you know, for 10,000, 10,000 years. This is when you have like hell of money. Yeah. 42 yeah. million, by the way. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 42 you have so costs. much money that you're like, eh, I feel like, and then on top of it, you're like, how will <laughs> yeah. people remember me right. in 10,000? Well, this is like, a, this is like pyramids, right? Like yeah. that's what they did. It's like, yeah, oh, I have so much money. Look at what I can do. We're yeah. teasing them a little bit about that. But you know, the, the truth is, $42 million is like you and I going running out spending 100 bucks. Yeah, I know. That's you a know drop in the bucket. For right. Me. And how cool would that be to, to spend 100 bucks and build something that will be talked about probably 10,000 years from you now? Hear I something? mean, if I had that kind of money, I would do shit. You like want to hear that. something crazy? So yeah. his wife, they got divorced, right? So she got half. Yeah. I think it was half of his money. Yeah. Instantly became, I think, the fourth or third richest <laughs> woman in the world. <laughs> Dude, she married well. She yeah, was like leap, leapfrog, yeah. uh, leapfrogged Oprah just by divorcing. Just divorced. Oh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 one of the wealthiest women in the world. I mean, all, all joking aside, she was with him before all this happened. I'm sure she helped and support. so it's well-deserved. Right? Yeah, helped support right. and all that stuff. But I thought that was funny. You know, you get divorced and you know, now you're on Forbes top, you know, <laughs> top richest people in the world. That'd be, that'd be interesting to see if like more billionaires started to do these kinds of things where they're like investing in, uh, you know, some, some kind of megalithic structure to like remember them 
them by or something. Well, are you are you guys from? I think it was in 1972. I want to say where we shot a satellite uh, or a, like a space explorer up into space, and on it. We had a gold record, gold disc. Yes, uh, yeah, record. that played all of like every language, and it says something Baby's like "Babies crying." Yeah, I thought and... we put that on the moon. Did we put that on the moon? No, I, we I, just I, shot it out into space. We just shot it out into space. Oh, and yeah. then on it is like a picture of uh, human anatomy, so you can see like here's a male, here's a female, blah blah blah. Yeah. And then we put mathematics. This is my favorite part, right? Here's my dick. No, this <laughs> that's not my favorite part. <laughs> They Aliens, hella yeah. big. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, did they give him a big one? Or yeah, like yeah, a, yeah. The, the statue of David kind yeah. of thing. You know no, I mean? no. Here's the part that I love the most. Then they put like these mathematical calculations on it because they figured that math is a universal language. Like any species that's advanced enough to find this will understand math. They might not how to. They might not know what English is or Spanish, but they'll know math. So they literally gave them the coordinates to find Earth. I thought that was very. Irresponsible. Yeah, why? <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? Man? How do we know if they have our best interests in mind? Yeah, yeah. we get invaded by aliens. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, how did we, you guys find? Yeah, us? we were trying to yeah. find somewhere to habitat. Yeah. Oh, look at this. Look, look at these idiots. Somewhere these water bears gained intelligence, see, and now they're coming for us. That's why I think they should shoot out. Uh, what they should have done is shot out a satellite and made it look hella scary. Like, here's humans, and we got claws, and like, like you said, big old dick and whatever. Right. Yeah, come find us. <laughs> <laughs> we dare you to come find us. Oh man. Anyway, it's pretty. We have ideas. Pretty funny stuff. Yeah. So I see. You guys uh, destroyed uh, the treats that I made. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, you were downplaying, what, hey, it, dude. You, I actually really enjoyed. Those I know. Cookies. I like. Yeah, I know. He came in. They're like, ah, oh, they're all right. They're actually they were phenomenal. Yeah. So, true. Be tell the truth here, though. Are you the baker or did Jessica bake? I made it. You did. No, I swear you to God. Did. No kidding. I did. So I made. The, so I went on the Organifi website because we were going to make cookies and you know have fun or whatever. And I thought, you know what? Adam's always talking about how um, he makes high protein baked snacks, or at least Katrina does, right? Yeah. So I thought this might be- a, I find them. That's why You find them and you <laughs> give them to her. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. You're always talking about it. So, yeah. And I've never done that. Here's the recipe. I've yeah. never. Now, to be fair, I've never baked anything. So it's really one of my first times doing it at all. But I said, I want to make it like a high protein you know, dish or whatever. So I looked on their website. I Googled uh, Organifi peanut butter and chocolate chip protein cookies, and they're good. They were good. They're not bad. And they they're in their the, if you eat the whole batch, it's like <laughs> 60 batch. grams of protein or something like that. Like cuz cuz it's got peanut butter in it, which yeah. has got the protein and yeah. then of course the the protein the, the plant protein powder that yeah. you put. In. So it's uh, I'll give the You use vanilla, I imagine. I did, but if you use chocolate it's probably better. Oh, you think so? I do. Yeah, I wonder about that. I yes. see I think vanilla works the best when you're baking. It blended that's, well that yeah, way. So just yeah, so that's coming from somebody who's done this a lot, personally I actually think even though you think chocolate would be Vanilla is like one of the best flavors to bake with. Really? It, yeah. Just, okay, so yeah. that's what I did. I did vanilla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, here's the here's how you make it. You get one cup of rolled oats, two scoops of what I used was the Organifi Complete Protein Powder, half a cup of chocolate chips. I actually use chocolate chunks. I like those better. Half a cup of ground flaxseed meal, half a cup of uh, peanut butter, one egg, one third a cup of honey or maple syrup. I use maple syrup. Uh, one teaspoon of pure vanilla extract and two tablespoons of coconut oil. Now check this out, right? You mix it all, mix it all in the bowl. Then you make them into the balls and you kind of press them down a little bit. 350 degrees, you bake them for five minutes. That's it. That's Just it. Five. Oh. five. Five to seven minutes max. You don't want to overdo it. They cook really fast. Yeah. But they're really good. No, they were and really good. And I dipped good. them in uh, in almond milk or whatever. Ah. So I had my high protein. Get you little baker guy. Yeah, yeah. What you, yeah. You should get you an apron, dude. Yeah, my cookies yes. brought the boys to the yard, apparently. <laughs> it certainly <laughs> did. Uh. I did a good job downplaying it, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. See, I, you know what my problem is? I usually oversell shit. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? I come in, these are awesome. We, we expect it. You, you know? did the so takeaway clothes this with the time dessert. I'm, I'm going to yeah. tell yeah, it's That's right, probably guys. why you got us to be interested. Yeah. You know, we're yeah, like, what? No, yeah. let me see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, dude, Justin, have you looked into that Love and Logic uh, course for kids yet? Oh, I raising I'd kids. Just just overviewed it just briefly, dude. I watched the fir only like the first three modules or whatever so uh -huh. far. And so I'm already applying the. Oh, you are. Dude, yeah, did you talk about this yet on the show? Because uh, I, I don't know if I talked about using it yet on the show. I no, talked right, about right, right. Uh, it worked. Wow, it like really worked. Well, like my ninja style. Or Actually, what? it's stupid that I never even thought of this. So this is a uh, this is a communication technique that you learn in sales. It's called the alternate advance, and, right. and what it is is rather than giving you, you you give people options, and both options you're happy with. So rather than this is a simple one, right? Rather than saying, "Would you like to buy my product?" The you know which the answers are what yes yeah. or no right no is not an answer Would that you we want rather buy this one or that one that's right. it right yeah. it's a, and so it's kind of like that and so what you do because what they talk about in this course is that if you have a power struggle with children 
either you win and they're resentful or they learn how to take orders, in which case they just become order takers and they go off to college and then, you know, their, their leader of their frat house tells them to do something and they do it. Um, or they rebel. Those are like the three main options that end up happening. So they say what you want to do is you want to give your kids the feeling of having power and control over their lives. That way you have, uh, a, when you do ask for things to be done, they're more likely to listen. And when they do make choices, they feel like it's their, this is their decision right. and they're not going to feel as rebellious or resentful or whatever. Way more powerful than that. Right. So I'll give you an example, right? So like, like my daughter's watching TV and I want her to, to turn it off. Uh, so and do the dishes. So I'll say, hey, um, uh, in, no, usually what I would do, like, hey, turn the TV off and do the dishes, right? Mm -hmm. That would always result in you know a little back and forth. Instead, what I'll say is, hey, do you want to stop watching this now and do the dishes, or do you want to watch another fifteen minutes and then do the dishes? <laughs> and, bro, it's, seriously, no joke. Jessica yeah. and I are sitting there, and we did this the whole day, right? We're doing this the whole day, and we're looking at each other and like You're just giving is, them options. We're instead. like, this is weird yeah. <laughs> because it's weird because my kids are literally like. Uh, oh, I'll wait 15 minutes. Or do you want to go? To, do you want to? Yeah. Would you like to brush your teeth now, or do you want to do it five minutes before bed? I'll wait five, and they just do it. Yeah. You say nothing else. It's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> this I'm waiting for it to not work. Right. Is what I'm waiting. Right. So far, so good. <laughs> I've had moments where I've done that, but I haven't realized that. I'm gonna have to really focus on that and experiment because that it, does make a lot of sense. It makes a huge difference. It's well, crazy. You're giving, you're giving them choice, yeah, even if awesome. both choices are what you want. You're still yeah. giving them choice, which pulls the authoritarian side out, right? And now yeah. it's more like together we're figuring this out, right? Yes. And then when you have to be <laughs> yeah. authoritarian, you say something like, "Look, don't I always give you lots of choices? Yeah. This one time, I'm telling you, this is what you need to do." And they say that that works. And so, and then the other one was. Uh, I'm trying to remember how this one worked. The other one was they say uh, they really emphasize on not showing that you're angry, mm -hmm. that you're you know pissed off or whatever. So because that just causes resentment. You always want them to feel like you're on their side. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you say something like I made popcorn for my daughter, right? This is just a simple example, and I made her a little bit. It's right before bed. I'm not going to make her a huge bowl of popcorn. It's not good for her or whatever. So I made her a little bit. So she eats it and and she goes, oh. She goes, you didn't make me that much. Why don't, can you just make me more? And so I laugh and I hug her and I said, nice try, turkey. And then she laughs and it's done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> turkey. I mean, yeah. I mean, all I did was say, nice try. And I give right. her a hug. Yeah. And she's like, ah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. And it was over. Uh, <laughs> I'm messing with you. Versus uh, telling yeah. her, no, the reason why you don't do this. Yeah, it's not right. good for lecture. They're against lectures. Yeah. Like if you tell your, like if your kid, well, rather than telling them to put your jacket on because it's cold, you say to them, would you rather hold your jacket or would you like me to hold your jacket? And if they still say, I don't want a jacket, whatever, you say, no problem. Then when you go outside and they're cold and they say to you, oh my God, it's so cold, dad. Then you give them a hug. You're like, I'm sorry, honey. I know it's cold. Don't lecture them. Yeah. Let them learn it's that shit on It's because it kind of goes against some of my programming of, you know, going through with my parents and like have been really stern about like, this is the way. Uh, and then like, I, I would get into some battles with, with Courtney about this because like, especially when it came to choosing food and choosing dinners and all this stuff, because then it becomes, you can become a short order cook. Right, everybody has different ideas, yes. and they went, "Well, I want this one, and I want this one," and I'm like, I'm like "You can't give them these options, you know. <laughs> this is what it is, yeah. you know." And I'm like hammering that, yeah. and uh, but then you know, she, she's done a good job of convincing me too that like, okay, well, what we're we'll do is we're gonna mark on the calendar and, and and set up our week, and we all get to kind of vote which mm -hmm. you know dinner we get to kind of place on on that day, and that's helped a lot. So it's a little bit sim like similar to that. It is, and in like I said, I I mean, I grew up the same way you did, Justin. If my dad said something, you just that's it. You had no choice. You got to do it. Very authoritative type yeah. stuff. That's how I was raised. And so that's what I want to do. And my the way I would do it normally is tell you to do this. If you say no, then I'm gonna, you know, give you a consequence. But this so far is is crushing. It's really yeah, weird. I feel yeah. like I'm in the twilight zone. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> keep, keep it going, keep yeah. keep me updated. Yeah, very strange. Anyway, um, I read a very interesting article on uh retail right now and how that's reshaping. Uh, due to COVID. Mm -hmm. Are you guys reading any of these articles about how companies oh, I, are? 100%. You know, it's, it's what's know, interesting it's to me right now and why I have this like uncertainty of like what will happen in the economy is there is definitely a clear divide in, you know, there is some companies that are, are dramatically struggling to the point that some are shutting down and failing. And, and I know that's what a lot of the news reports, but there's the other side of companies that are, are, are actually flourishing during this time. So it's really interesting to read you know, uh, about all the different ones that are having success and then why ones are failing. And then how is this going to reshape the way we do business in the next six months to a year? That's what I think. Right. I think what we're going to see is it's going to 
there's going to be some changes that are going to be temporary, and then I think there might be some permanent mm -hmm. changes in people's behavior. So here's some figures from the retail industry. I, as I read these, I was pretty blown away. 8.7% drop in retail sales. That's the largest ever recorded. Now, that makes sense, considering they're all forced to be closed, right? Mm -hmm. But that's a big hit. Here's the next number. A billion dollars. That's how much cash that Gap has burned since February. A billion dollars. Just trying to maintain their stores and because it's they're closed. And they're saying right now that they are going to have to uh, furlough people and stop paying rent pretty soon because they're literally running out of wow. all of their saved cash. Are I'll, they moving completely into the direct uh, to consumer market? Well, they already have that, don't they? They, they do. Okay. So here's what a lot of analysts, so analysts at US, UBS are predicting that 100,000 retail stores will be closed by 2025 permanently. Hundred thousand, a hundred thousand. That's a lot of storefronts, locations, wow. and they they say that e-commerce will pick it up and you know stuff like that. That's gonna be coming. That's crazy. That yeah. is crazy. You know, it's, it's gonna be like a like ghost town. You know how in the gold rush, like you'd have these towns kind of pop up, and then you have all these buildings and everything, and then you go back, nobody even lives there anymore. Yeah. But even with something like this, I think just more people were gonna go e-commerce. That's got to affect uh, commercial property sales, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't you think that'll just make them plummet? Well, I wonder how they're going to be repurposed, you know? Like, uh, what kind of businesses will fill those spots? Well, we talked about this before, and I, I think this is a safe bet. I think companies will still have brick-and-mortar places where you could touch things and try them on, mm -hmm. but then you buy them online. Like, just a display. Well, yes. look, look, I mean, talk about, I mean, I love talking about our partners who that we, I, we vetted and took our time, and here's another win, like when you look at Viore. Mm -hmm. Look how their model is built. They exactly. Were, they were built as direct-to-consumer first, and then when they open up shops, okay, so they, they've slowly started to build brick and mortars, but the way they build them, very tiny. Yeah. I mean, it's literally like a showcase, and that's how they set it up. It's more of a showcase, allow you to come in, try on fit, so you go, oh, these shorts fit like this, I'm this size, oh... But then after you've done that, after you've probably visited this store once or twice, mm -hmm. you probably don't ever go back anymore. Mm -hmm. Once you once you've because that's the hardest part about clothes, right? You have to understand yeah, you that. You want to know how they fit. Right. The hardest part about selling clothes completely online and not having a store is until you get an opportunity to try these clothes on. It's really tough to and, and Viore is a good example because Viore does fit me different than a lot of other clothes. Like I have to do a size up on my shorts and my pants, but my shirts are the same size. Exactly. Do you remember uh, that company, Adam, that we were looking at that was was trying to yes, address virtual. this virtually, yeah. like it was like for Nordstrom, I think. But yeah, they would have you stand in front of a mirror, and then basically they would it, it would dress you like, like superimpose, yeah, superimpose uh -huh. it on top of you, and you would kind of turn around and see how it fit and looked. But I wonder, I wonder about that if that still exists, so or they're trying to move with that. So that was, so I think that was like a, a failed idea. Like right? they tried to do it, and it didn't pan out the way they were supposed to. I think it was a, a lot of tech, a lot of money. It wasn't quite the same. Who I think is going to replace, or you're going to see a surge, and so the fact that we get off this would be a good idea for us to look up and see who's publicly traded. That's a company like this. Are the the trunk companies? I know what you're talking about. Yeah, the oh, yeah. companies that send trunks to you. You're on a monthly membership the with them, yeah. and you try it all on, and then you just send back what you don't want. That model, I think, is brilliant right now for this because. Oh yeah, I can see that. Yeah, the 3D one. I mean, you got to have this big, massive thing. You still have to go. Still in. not the same. Still as trying to go it. try it. Yes, yeah. and it's still not the same with the feel of yeah. putting the clothes on and seeing yourself in the mirror. Sure, it, what it did do that I thought was interesting was it 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 gave a 3D image of your body and it said, you know, Adam, these styles of jeans will fit you best based mm -hmm. off of your hip to ankle ratio, whatever. And so that that made sense and sent me in a good direction to go look, but I still wanted to put them on and try it's them still on. still an emotional thing. Right. Yeah, so yeah. I think the companies that will do really well right now with a lot of these retail places starting to close down are the ones that already have a really good model in place for shipping. And there's there's a lot now. It's become very it's become a competitive space. Well, so here's the the one uh, knock I have against it because I've bought clothes online. I love doing it, but the knock is when you return them. They try to make it as easy as possible, but I don't think it's easy enough. If they make it so easy, first off, that you order the clothes and you get them either that day or the day after, which is becoming very possible now with a lot of these uh, these companies, is if you don't like it. You gotta you gotta print off the thing, then you gotta bring it somewhere that will take it back or whatever. They need to make it so easy that I try it on, I don't like it, I leave it outside and it's gone. Well, the the trunk ones are pretty close to that. They do, but it's mm -hmm. subscription. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah but you, yeah, but what you can every if you don't want anything right now and it comes in, you just send it right back every time. Yeah, mm -hmm. every so you time. can send the whole thing back. Yeah, you and send never the, pay yeah. a dollar. Yes, exactly. Oh, 
I yeah, thought you what always, you keep, you you end up buying. I thought you always no, pay. You only, Courtney does this. You, she has a all set up. Yeah, you only pay what you keep. It's oh, brilliant. This is nice. Yeah, it's brilliant. Because no, then you have fun trying on clothes. Absolutely. And, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, so wow. and, and it's a it's a very smart model because even if you weren't shopping for something, you get this nice little trunk or crate that comes in, and then you try it on. You're like, oh shit, yeah. I like these. I'm gonna keep well, these. And Send they have us. like a personal sort of tailor. I don't know know what you call them, but somebody like a stylist that that kind of like yeah puts every outfit puts it together. all together, and then mm-hmm. you you have this conversation with them. Oh, this didn't work so well. And mm-hmm. Like so, she she has that. Com- I like it in this color more, and sends it back. So oh, well, see, this may cool. be the the one push that it needed to grow. You yeah. know what I mean? Because I think so. if you're so used to going to the store and then they're convincing you to do it this way and it's such a different way of shopping, like me, I'm reluctant, but now I may be more open to doing that. Well, there especially was- like Justin's saying, if they actually start to, because that's nice. If you've ever had a personal shopper help you, uh, which I have. It's, which it's, I it's, need. It, it's nice. <laughs> yes. I, even if you're somebody who's <laughs> yeah. into, into fashion and you think you can put outfits together pretty well, it's still, it's a professional. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? It's it's even if you're just like us, we talk about personal training. I mean, you, mm-hmm. just because you know weights and you understand understand it doesn't mean having hiring a professional to take you to another level. It's the same thing with someone with fashion. Um, like you have somebody put outfits together who's supposed to be good at that shit. I mean, you they put. Yeah. I may want to try this. Yeah. Well, so um, I think uh, a lot of our buying behaviors are going to be changed permanently. I don't think everything's going to be changed permanently, but I do think that this situation is going to push kind of what was falling. I mean, retail stores were already starting to lose ground against you know e-commerce. Lots of businesses were doing that. Education, yeah. uh, people were already saying, hey, this is way too expensive for what I'm getting. I think that this situation is pushing kind of what was falling and making it happen a little faster. And there was a huge survey that was just done with tons of consumers, and this paints a very, very interesting picture. Was uh, Doug? Was this you who shared one? I think it was Doug who shared it. Did you share the bubble? The uh, the um, education education bubble. Who yeah. shared that? Oh right. I think I did. Oh uh, uh, yeah, I did. And basically, what it's talking about is now that people and kids and students are getting a taste of going to school online, and as it, if it continues to extend, I think a lot of kids and parents are going to say, "Hey, mm-hmm. why am I spending?" You know, fit twenty, thirty thousand dollars in tuition when it's all online, and there's right. all these online competitors. I think that more educators are going to start to move in that direction. Is what I think. Did the article say? What did the article allude? The article did talk about that. Okay. Because you got to, again the cost of college oh, now so inflated. It's inflated partially, be, main, mainly because it, there's easy money to get to go to college because we've deemed it to be necessary. Yeah. And so they're all fighting for this money, and you you're paying. So much money to go to college that I mean, this is a true fact now. A loan you absolutely have to pay off. Yeah, and medical look at medical profession is an example of of a of profession that you have to go to college, right? I mean, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you can go to college, or you don't have to go to college, and you know you can do great both ways. You want to be a doctor, you you're not, you can't practice without going to formal education. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of kids are not going to school to become general practitioners because the pay of general practitioner. Doesn't doesn't justify the cost of going to college. You graduate with a two hundred two hundred fifty thousand dollar college debt, and now you graduate and you're making what one hundred twenty one hundred thirty grand for the first few years or five years of work. And mm-hmm. so what they're doing is they're saying, I, you know what, I'm not going to be a GP. I'm going to be uh, this other doctor who's going to make more money. So they're starting to see drops in enrollment because of that. I'm so surprised that we haven't seen the Google's, Facebooks, Amazon. Uh, company Apple start creating their own uh, almost like tech schools, you know, where instead mm. of instead of having you go to get a degree and and whatever and looking for PhDs or, and trying to hire them on, starting your own institute that is just a hundred percent Apple, like everything mm-hmm. you need to know about Apple, and then the levels of uh, the degrees and certifications based off of how long you're in it, and then it costs a certain amount of money, and then in addition to that, it almost guarantees you a right. job or a position. Like you just absorb like MIT professors to I them just, in there yeah. and teach everybody. I just don't see why, why. I wonder if that's on the horizon for them. And I, I, I would think, think so. I think the situation that we're in right now is going to move in that. It's going to push in that direction. Look, I, they just did this huge survey which is very telling. You guys got to hear some of the, the results of the survey of people. This survey, they surveyed you know, uh, 1,000, almost 2,000 U.S. adults between April 3rd and April 6th. So right in the middle of this whole pandemic and what's going on or whatever, they found that 69% of Americans who were polled are extremely worried about traveling on airlines. 62% are extremely worried about visiting restaurants. They found that 76% of these adults admitted that they were extremely worried about taking a cruise liner again. 
and 43% of them said that this fear will last forever. 72% of respondents said that if they have to do another 30 days of lockdown, that it would force them to a mental or emotional breaking point. Wow. wow. And yes. Uh, and 100% said that they'll have some type of mental or emotional breakdown if they ran more than six months of this stay-at-home orders. And there's more and more in this. They, 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 they surveyed them about their purchasing habits and what they would do. Yeah, I wonder, and many of them said they'll be changed permanently. I know Disney's been affected quite a bit with their theme parks. I was thinking about theme parks, about that. Like if, if that's already being thought of in terms of like how they're going to be able to shuttle people and not have them so close together and how that's all going to change Dude, in that landscape. I, if, I mean, if they – well, see, here's the thing about Disney. Disney's got some of the most powerful lobbies in, in Washington – so I would assume that they're got they are spending lots of money trying to prevent regulators from saying Disney you can reopen but you got to have six feet away from you know apart from people. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you're, you're gonna pay five thousand dollars for a ticket. Well, not only I know, you're right, not only that you can't every ride is you're right next to yeah, a person. Yeah, like exactly. You're yeah. standing in the, their thing was like you stand in line and they try to make an experience out of that right, distract you while yeah. you're waiting forever. That's you know? you know I hadn't even thought about theme parks like Disney and oh, Great yeah. American stuff like that like. You, and you're when you're on a ride too, you're, you're yelling with your mouth wide open, <laughs> fucking saliva flying. <laughs> Some <laughs> kid vomits. <laughs> yeah, that ain't gonna. Bro, I didn't even think about that. Like that ain't gonna fly, dude. No more vomit comets. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I imagine your kids licking the freaking railing and next I mean, to the ride. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? I think it's almost they totally guaranteed they're gonna. I mean, they will mask, mask, and maybe even that'd be so weird though. Uh, imagine going going on rides. They're one hundred percent gonna tech, check your temperature. They're gonna do all the the scanning and like they're gonna be sophisticated in the way they test. People Dude, this is why I think it's crazy. And we did that episode right on the the fitness industry, and and uh, it's it's going viral. A lot of people talking about it, and it, it, it's funny to me that there's actually people that actually still believe like, oh, everything will be normal when, and it opens back up. I'm like, okay, you represent no way. you represent a very small percentage of people that think that way. If you do, <laughs> because yeah, if things are forever, you, you going, want to think that it's way. forever going to change, yes. and at the bare minimum, it's going to change dramatically until we have a vaccine. Yes, yeah. so at, at the, least at, until we have a vaccine, it's going to dramatically change. At the very least, large social gatherings like uh, concerts or sporting events or Disneyland, at the very least. They'll, they're going to be massively changed until there's a vaccine or mass uh, immunity, until we get herd immunity. Yeah. But for sure, look, September 11th is another sc in recent scary you know, situation that happened. Are there Were there permanent changes that happened from September 11th? Yes. Yeah. Now, some of them were fear-based at first, and then we kind of went back to normal for a lot of stuff. But there are permanent changes. Going through an airport today has been permanently changed yeah. since September. Yeah, I'll give you a stupid example. This is a silly one. I never, You never had to take your shoes off when you went through the, the airport. That was directly one related. One guy fucked it up for everybody. <laughs> that was directly related to September 11th. They didn't have the kind of checks that they have now and checking people and air marshals on every plane. And then you know we passed laws that say that they could read your emails and go through your shit without... You know any you know judge trial or jury that was all permanent and, after September 11th. And yeah, you're talking about works. something that just affected one space. Exactly. Mm -hmm. This is something that is affecting all, all spaces the across the board, and more some more than others. Right. That's why it's going to be really really interesting to see like what. And I, I didn't even think about theme yeah. parks. Now, now theme I, parks are going to be crazy. Uh, now I do yeah. think that at some point they're going to be reopened. At some point we'll have these mass social gatherings. And the main reason why I think that is because. Part of our nature as humans, what makes us human is we're so social. We're the most. Oh yeah, we want to connect. We have to. It's yeah. it's part of who we are. And at some point, we're not going to care. We're just gonna be like, mm. fuck it. I just want. But wear those full body condoms. Yeah. But there's going to be some some permanent changes. I don't know how small they'll be, but I'm sure they're going to be some permanent lingering changes that'll last. Yeah. You know, forever. So anyway, we'll see. Yeah. What since I was at my parents and and we were going through some of my old stuff, my mom kept like everything, dude. It's crazy. And and. Uh, she brought out some of those old starter jackets. You remember those like Bro. starter jackets? Like I had the parkas. Yeah, my brother had the Lakers. I was always rocking the Bulls park. Uh, uh, the the starter jacket. And my my kids really wanted it, and like I had like two versions of it, and so they both started wearing it, and I thought it was funny, and I I was like, dude, you don't even know Michael Jordan yet, you know? Oh, like they don't dude. they didn't even watch any of that, and uh, that that documentary just came out. Uh, I don't know last, if you checked it out oh, yet, Adam. Dude, no, I've been watching it. Uh, it seemed like ten times. No. I <laughs> <laughs> the last dude, dance. It brings you right back. Oh man. man, the last dance. It's it's actually do you know that it's breaking records right now? Really? Oh yeah. Is it's, it on what is it on Netflix? ESPN. ESPN. It's on ESPN. It's broken all sports uh viewed records right now. Now of course it's COVID nineteen, so there's not sports going on, but of all the things that they're playing, 
nothing is drawing more more attention. They had to move it up too, right? They so they did, and I think I think it was a very smart move right now, right? There's no sports going on. It was supposed to. I think I think it was supposed to play in another month or two, and so they pushed it up. And they're actually what they're doing, and I don't know if they had planned to do this originally, but every weekend they drop two episodes back to back hour. Mm -hmm. So instead of like dripping you one a week like normally Mm -hmm. you would. There's back to back, which I love that. So I get to watch like two hours of it back to back. Is it all about him? It's all about the Bulls. The team. Yeah, the team during that year. Now, of course, it's centered around Jordan, mm-hmm. but it it literally goes through each player, kind of tells their story, and it it it's man. footage that they never released to, which is oh, really cool. Yeah. It's like you know, it's the sixth dynasty, you know, like season, uh, you know, where they're they're going for the championship again. It goes through all this stuff, and you see, you know, all the characters like Rodman, and you know, you get right back into mm-hmm. it. Scotty Pippen, oh, man, I, I love it. You That's know, great. It, it was. Uh, I'm also uh, finishing up a book called Great Teams, which they they you use sports teams and draw analogies with them with like some of your great businesses, and that it's mm-hmm. funny that that this documentary is going on right now, and they reference that that dynasty in sports uh, so many times in there about like just leadership and one of the things that I and role players yeah I, I brought something up uh, off I air sometimes <laughs> I brought something up off air with you guys that the it was just on my mind recently because I just was uh, reading this part of the book it just sometimes people uh, avoid like having the the like loud personality or the person that doesn't click with the rest of the group. And they, they actually talk about the, how healthy that can be to have kind of an outlier or somebody who's like that. The challenge is though, is learning how to integrate them into a, a, a cohesive team when they are not cohesive and they're mm-hmm. not like everybody else. And they use Dennis Rodman. I was just going to ask yeah. if it was Dennis Rodman. Yeah. Dennis Rodman is the example that they use. He's the in ultimate there. team player. Yeah. And it's really cool in the documentary. They, they talk about, he managed him. There, I'll use one example without spoiling the whole show that I thought was so unique. And I didn't know that I've actually read Rodman's book. I've read Phil Jackson's book and I didn't know this part. Uh, they, they used to let Rod, so Rodman comes over. He was first with the Detroit Pistons. So a little backstory. So the non-sports fans like Sal can get an idea what's going mm. on here. Detroit Pistons were like the bad, with us. were the bad boys, right? <laughs> and Dennis Rodman was drafted by them and they were known for throwing elbows, starting fights and yeah. being the bad boys yeah. of, of, of the league. Was Charles Barkley on that team? No, he no. was not. Okay. So I just had to throw a name in there. <laughs> people know. No, <laughs> I know names. So Dennis, <laughs> Dennis Rodman, it, Dennis Rodman is this like wild child. He goes to San Antonio he's dying his hair he's rebelling he dates madonna goes like yeah. like completely goes off the deep in that way of like expressing himself Cross dresser before it was cool right yeah. exactly all that stuff and the bulls decided to take him to to bring him on and there's this like oh my god are we really going to bring this disaster and he uh, jerry kraus who was the uh, gm of of the um bulls, of bulls. the bulls knows this, brings him over, but he knows that Phil Jackson has the ability to manage and, and manage and lead him. One of the things that he allows him to do, Rodman comes after like this, they were, they're on this streak when Scottie Pippen was out and injured, and he is like busting his ass. He's setting all kinds of records with rebounds and killing it, and just he's known as a workhorse, mm-hmm. right? And he comes to Phil Jackson, he's like, I need a vacation. And he tell, and middle of the season. And tells, middle tells of yeah, middle of the season, he tells <laughs> Phil Jackson that, and and then tells uh, Michael Jordan that, and Jordan's like, "What the fuck? Was, <laughs> vacation? I need a vacation. What do you need vacation?" And Phil Jackson actually goes, "Okay, all right, all right, Rodman, forty eight hours." He goes, "Yeah, I need to get, I need to go somewhere. Vegas. I'm gonna go to Vegas." And so they talk about in the documentary. Jordan's like rolling his eyes, like, "I can't believe, like, in the middle of the season, we're giving this kid the 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 right to go and yeah. go on vacation." And sure as shit, he goes for forty eight hours. He doesn't return for like a week, dude. Oh. Yeah, but the way they handle him because he comes back, and when he comes back, he's like leading everybody in practice, out hustling everybody, busting ass. Mm. And so, like, kind of the moral of the story is that you know when it comes to work, and it came, it comes to like playing as a team and and being there for your guys. Like they get allow him that latitude, and I think about that in our own team. Like we have people on our team that are different personalities, and yet we are so cohesive the way we run, and we don't shy away from having co- internal conflict and struggle. We just manage through it and allow everyone to be their their individual selves. I think that's a lot of the success. Yeah. So yeah. now I read that Rodman had sex with Carmen Electra on the 
practice the, the the basketball floor. What is that called? The, I the court. Wouldn't doubt that. I read that. That that was yeah. the thing that they. Had oh, done. so Carmen Electra was the was the his girlfriend and was the girl who he hooked up with in Vegas when Phil Jackson and Michael Jordan got on a plane to go get him from Vegas. <laughs> they walked in. They bang on the door. She freaks out, covers herself in in the sheets so they can't so they can't see her, and they and they pull him out. And Jordan says that he won't disclose what else was going on in the, in the, <laughs> in the to sell him out. Well. Uh, 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 Rodman's buddy in North Korea. Did you guys hear? I think he might be dead. Hmm? Kim Young Ju. I heard he was Kim, sick, whatever. but yeah, I didn't. Kim Jong Un. Kim Jong Un. I don't yeah. know the story. He, I guess they were operating on him, and because the surgeon, the North Korean surgeon, this is the story, is not used to working on obese patients because, you know, he's the only obese person in all of North Korea because everyone else is starving. Right. Uh, apparently, he was in a vegetative state. And the rumors are that he died, and now his sister's going to take over. No and the internet's way. going ape shit because what? his sister is pretty. So now everybody's going nuts over his sister potentially. I did not hear right? any of this. Yeah, so this is the rumor, but apparently he was in a vegetative state or dead. Or he's dead. And, that, and now Dennis Rodman well, that's huge news. was invited to North Korea by him because this Kim, uh, Kim the leader, is, was a huge fan of basketball in the NBA. And he went there. When he came back, he was like talking about how great of a guy. I think he just, you know, he kind of pumped his brakes or whatever, or pumped yeah. his, his tires a little bit. So I anyway. did not know that. I didn't even hear that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's crazy. So he might he might be dead. You right sure now? he's not just wow. setting the table for like a resurrection and make him even more? Because he, isn't he the one that oh, claims man. he doesn't shit too? Yeah, because yeah, he burns his energy. I was going to say, energy. is he all backed up with Yeah, yeah. This is just all... No, over. no. This is the story right now that he was in a vegetative state. He's going to he's gonna, he's gonna rise three days later. I am your great yeah, I've heard that story before. Yeah. First... Question is from Jay Rosen 10. What are the best exercises for training obliques? Oh, for some reason, the obliques it fell out of favor to train. Actually, I know what the reason is. You love to talk yeah. about this one. Yeah, idiots in the <laughs> in the side bend, side physique bend, side bend. and bodybuilding world talking about how training your obliques will make you get this huge waist and whatever. Uh, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Now, maybe them, because they're so massively muscled and they're on tons and tons of gear. Maybe that makes sense for them, but for the average person, there's no there's no truth to this whatsoever. If you look at um, ancient sculptures from the Greeks or the Romans, and remember back in those days, they didn't have bodybuilders to sculpt. They based their sculptures off of their gladiators and their athletes and what they saw to be high-performing athletes. And what you'll notice in all of them is all of them have well-developed obliques. Obliques are some of the most important performance muscles that you can have and important stabilizer muscles that you can have as an athlete, your obliques are what give you a lot of the power to throw punches and balls and kick and run and twist and all that stuff. So very, very important muscles to to train. I'm always skeptical of somebody I see like that's really shredded and cut and doesn't have pronounced obliques. I'm like, you're not that strong. Yes. I guarantee it. Well, yes. it's it. It's first of all, it's probably one of the one of the more underrated muscles, right? Totally. On your, on your body. And to your point too, it's if you are somebody who can deadlift or squat a lot of weight, it's a it's a stabilizer. Yeah, I mean, you have to. So those those ones will naturally get developed if you do a good job of doing that. So to your point, Justin, like yeah, it's an obvious sign that someone isn't that strong mm, right. if they have really weak uh, obliques, even if the rest of their body now, looks really developed. My favorite exercises for obliques. Now I have favorites that are more of like a sculpting, developing exercise, and then I have favorites that are more of a performance exercise. Now. The you know I didn't play basketball and football and baseball, but I did do judo, jujitsu, and wrestling, and I did train my obliques uh, from an athletic standpoint as well. So let's start with the sculpting exercise. I like uh, cable chops, cable mm -hmm. chops coming from the top, the Those side, from the bottom. When I'm doing them from a sculpting standpoint, it's controlled. My bottom uh, part of my body is stabilized, and I'm developing my obliques. You know, similar way that I would develop my biceps. I'm doing reps controlling the repetition, trying to feel the obliques stretch and squeeze. Now, from a performance standpoint, I'm doing those exercises explosively and I'm pivoting off my feet. Yeah. Now I'm chopping quickly or better yet, I used to like to do this with bands. Bands was my favorite way to do these explosive type chops. See, movements. I love to do that with uh, med balls and against Throws. the wall. Yeah, yeah. thrown against the wall. There's just so many uh, explosive power type uh, movements you can do like that that have so much carryover and translate so well to uh, athletic pursuits. Uh, I also really like. 
um, what was that one called? It's it's the one where you, where you have like a counter rotation exercise. Yeah, well, yeah, not not just that, not just anti rotation rotation, but uh, also like Russian a, twist, the landmine. Oh, sorry, yeah, I was <laughs> throwing them out there. <laughs> <laughs> one of them will stick. Uh, yeah, no, the land landmine rotations too, because then uh, as I'm keeping it in tight, I can really emphasize my obliques to stabilize that weight mm. on the eccentric part. Definitely, so I, I I cable. Cable chops for me because you can you can use cable chops either as like a heavy slow grinding strength training tool or you can use it explosive kind of similar you're saying like with the med ball so mm -hmm. wood chop I mean wood chops is what we call it or cable chops I think are are the best I mean that's my favorite for developing them specifically but just incorporating rotational and anti rotational movements mm -hmm. so I mean even you can take something like a like a, a dumbbell row right a single arm dumbbell row mm -hmm. and you can throw especially because if if you're pretty strong you can row a pretty good amount of, of weight on that and if you actually throw some rotation in there you'll probably be able to row even more so I love doing that as like a rotational movement and you get in obliques involved in that a lot when and you then that. of course too for isometric uh, you know, farmer carries will basically, um, you, you know, like if you do that for the suitcase carry, so you just do one side and you really isolate uh, and, and, you know, focus on really like keeping your body in good posture as you're walking with with that kind of weight. It really, you know, has, has a good effect. Well, I'll tell you, you know, um, when I did, uh, because I followed the MAP Strong program and it's a, it, it, there were farmer carries, heavy farmer carries in there. And that was the first time I'd ever done them consistently in a workout. And I could not believe the muscle that I put on my back, mm -hmm. on my my forearms, and my core. Mm -hmm. My core got so strong from doing heavy, just even not even doing a suitcase carry, just a just a both hands. I'm in a trap bar and I'm doing heavy walk while I'm bracing my core. Well, think about that too, how your arms have a propensity to just slightly move. And yeah, so right. all these little tiny movements, you have to be able to stabilize and have that anti-rotational effect. So if I'm moving forward, I don't want my arms to swing. I want to keep my core in place. I want to be able to, to brace properly. So your obliques uh, are, are fired up like crazy. Next question is from Marissa Lane. How do I fix duck, duck feet? I not only have external rotation when I squat, but while I am walking as well. Is mobility work enough to get to the point where I'm walking naturally with my feet straight? Yes, uh, mobility work can make a can huge... Can we also fix duck lips? <laughs> yeah, that's that a big help. problem. I'm they're, pro duck they're, lips. They're, so, <laughs> thanks, Adam. Um, so, so, obviously, like it sounds, someone's feet turn out. Now, I've worked with uh, a few people where this is a big problem. All of them were dancers. All of them had a background in ballet or dance, which actually emphasizes that external rotation. Mm -hmm. The other people that I've worked with that have this, this type of a problem didn't have it as severely, but it came from having collapsed arches, flat feet, just poor ankle mobility. So if your ankle doesn't have good mobility, your feet will naturally want to turn out to make up for uh, this problem. So this is typically an issue that either starts at the hip where your hip doesn't internally rotate very strongly, or more often than not, unless you're that dancer, um, it comes from weak feet mm -hmm. and ankle mobility. If your feet are weak and they don't have the strength, because if you look at if you if you were to Google right now foot anatomy or foot muscular anatomy, you would be very surprised to see that there are lots and lots of muscles in the foot. The foot is not just a a, a rigid extension of your leg that you just like a, it's not like you're standing on a stilt or something like that yeah. it is very it, it's supposed to be very active and if those muscles aren't doing what they're supposed to do it's going to throw you off and a good way to, to to look at this is like the wear and tear and see where you're really callousing and where you're you're putting most of your weight uh you know on your feet uh and, and that's one thing that I, I know like dr brink helped to kind of highlight that triangle of of pressure that you want really want to see if you can maintain and, and, and train your body to uh, uh, stabilize uh, in that direction a little bit more. And that's, that's, you know, typically where your the tongue of your shoe uh, and then your big toe and then, and then, and then your, your pinky toe and kind of dispersing that force between all, all three of those points. So this is exactly, I'll tell you what I would do with a client. Uh, every time before we work out, this is what it would look like. I would do uh, 90, 90 work for the hips, I would do combat stretch for the ankles. Then I would take you barefoot, squeeze a basketball, and really concentrate on your feet the way it's, they're planted on the floor, like Justin's saying, that triangle, and, and squeezing the basketball and doing deep, as deep a squats as you can, holding it, squeezing the basketball between your knees while you while you work on just the mechanics. Between that priming, so if you do those two for the priming movements, 
and then go in and you do that for your your strength training is work on that. And that is what I, I would have my client do that all the time until we start to work. That's a great them. combination. So in, in short foot is another exercise. If you're having trouble activating your feet, mm -hmm. there's a movement called short foot. And essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to squeeze the muscles in your arch. It's almost like you're trying to create a stronger arch in your foot. Um, that'll help you connect to that position. Then when you do that last exercise Adam talked about where you have the basketball between your legs, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to activate your feet, then do your squats. That's a great combination. Next question is from May Punk. Why would my weight go up a couple of pounds after I started fitting into my clothes differently? I cl clearly look like I'm losing weight, but the scale is not reflecting that. I've been doing maps anywhere. This, this is, is a beautiful yeah. place. Yeah, what the, a great problem. You're winning. This is exactly what you want. Your weight, remember your weight represents just your whole body. What's on your body, how much it weighs. So to be more specific, if I cut your leg off, right, you're going to lose, I don't know, 20 pounds. Um, are you happy that you lost 20 pounds because you lost your leg? Of course not. What you're experiencing is more muscle on your body and some fat loss. Now, why does this look like you're losing weight? Because body fat is more voluminous in per pound. So to give you an extreme example, right now, imagine a pound of iron. Imagine how, what that would look like. A pound of iron would look like Very a small, dense. small ball, right? Now think of a pound of cardboard. It's a lot bigger. It takes up more space because the cardboard isn't as dense. Now, fat and muscle aren't that extreme in terms of their difference, but it's enough to make a big difference to where if you gained – four pounds of muscle and lost, you know, two pounds or three pounds of body fat, the scale is going to show that you're heavier, but your body is going to look leaner and you're going to feel differently when well, you put your clothes here, on. Here, I'll give you what, exactly what we used to have in the gym. Uh, so if you want a good visual, uh, if five pounds of, of muscle looks like a softball and five pounds of fat looks like one of those fire logs. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the difference. So if that's what the fight they, they should, so that's a massive difference. So as you lose that body fat, you're going to, it's going to come, it's going to condense the inches, right? So your waistline will go down, but the scale may stay the same. And honestly, th this is where I want to be with every client. I act, my goal, whenever I, no matter what their goal is, body fat reduction, muscle building, just being healthy. I am looking for them to start to see like their waistline tighten up. They get stronger in the gym, but our scale staying right about the same mm -hmm. because I know that we're, we're having a nice exchange. We're losing about two or three pounds of body fat and we're gaining about two, th two or three pounds of muscle. Scale is saying the same, but they are seeing a difference in the mirror. They're seeing a difference on inches on their waist. That means you have a very nice balance of your training and nutrition regimen. means you're right on, yeah. right in, on pace. In, in Maps Anywhere, even though it's a program where you're not using barbells, dumbbells, and machines because it was designed for at-home use or you know to work out anywhere, is a still a very effective muscle builder. If you right. follow MAPS anywhere, you are going to build some muscle, which then speeds up your metabolism. So if you stay on this path, if you have a lot of body fat to lose, and this is blowing you away, why do I look leaner? I'm gaining weight on the scale. I still have 30 pounds to lose. Stay on track. Stay on track. You're going to start to lose body fat in a hurry, especially now that you've built some muscle um, and your metabolism's faster. You know, when I was a, a back in the day, I used to, this was a, a, a way that I would, sell resistance training to, to clients, especially early days of, of personal training, because back in those days, women in particular were very apprehensive to lift weights. So I had this female trainer uh, that worked for me. Her name was Homera, and she was built. She was lean. She was very toned and sculpted, you know, nice legs, glutes, delts, arms. Most women who came into the gym would point her out and say, wow, that's what I want to look like. So what I would do when I would talk to women about lifting weights is I would page this trainer to my desk. Then I'd have Homero walk up to the to the potential client and I'd say, okay, I want you to guess how I, much- I used to do the same yeah, thing. I'd how say, much she weighs. I'd say, I want you to guess how much she weighs. Yeah. And I, every single time they would say, oh, like 105, 110. And I'd say, okay, Homero, how much you weigh? 140 pounds. And they would be blown away to the point where we'd have to walk over her scale mm -hmm. and weigh them. And then I'd say, see, she's muscle and she's lean and that's- how you want to look. So let's not worry so much about the scale. Let's put some muscle on your body. It'll let you eat more food. So now you can stay leaner, easier. You're stronger and more mobile. And oh, by the way, you'll look better anyway. Next question is from Jessica Arkebeck. How much neat is too much? Can you overdo it? 
Does your body get too efficient with a certain daily step count like it would with long distance endurance cardio? We, it's too much when it becomes neato. Well, yeah, <laughs> we. I think we need to clear clear some things up because I, you know, we started talking about neat more than anybody I know in the space a, a long time ago, and there's there's a little bit of blurriness here, right? Uh, you know, neat is technically non exercise, so it's it's things that you just would naturally do. Um, actively walking would actually technically fall under the the you know movement or cardio. It wouldn't necessarily fall under neat. So you know, can you do too much neat? No, like you're you you can't uh, do things that are naturally creating movement and calorie burn throughout your day because it's such a low level of intensity. It's not uh, exercise, so you can't do too much neat. Um, I, you, I guess you could technically do too much walking. I mean, if you were walking so much that you're burning so many calories and you're under consuming, you're going to send a signal to the body to become efficient with those calories and potentially slow the metabolism down. So yeah. it really depends on how you're fueling your it, body. It depends on your goals, who you are. You know, if you're moving too much, is it hurting your joints? Is your goal maximum muscle gain? That's a different answer than if your goal is just overall health, which is different than if you want lots of endurance. Like it really does depend on an, on the individual. Plus, I do want to make this point here: there is a certain amount of cardio or neat or whatever you want to call it that will actually help your body also build muscle. Because I don't want people to think the opposite. What I don't want is people to think, "Oh, my goal is to build as much muscle as possible. Therefore, I'm going to avoid all cardio and all activity." That will also reduce muscle building because some form of cardiovascular activity or amount of cardiovascular activity is going to improve your health which will then improve your body's ability to build muscle. Like for me, for example, who, you know, your classic, you know, ectomorph for, you know, when I was growing up, it was hard for me to build muscle. You know, I used to be afraid of any cardio. Like don't do any cardio. All I'm going to do is lift weights. That was actually a mistake. I had to do some to maintain my health, to have good health, which would then help my body build muscle. And I've noticed now that if I just lift weights, I don't build as much muscle than if I lift weights and incorporate some form of cardiovascular activity, whether it's, whether it's walking or hiking. But what's too much? I mean, it all depends on the person, the mm -hmm. goal, you know, what, what you're looking to do with your body. If your goal is to have lots of endurance, you're going to do way more of this stuff than if your goal is to build maximal muscle. And if you want great health, um, I it's probably best to do some form of walking or cardiovascular activity every single day. Yeah, I think, I mean... It if, if I'm getting too much activity per day, you're going to know that. Like if I have a really rigorous job, if I'm, I'm constantly on my feet, I would, I would definitely make sure that my nutrition is, is supplementing that. And so I'm getting adequate nutrition to kind of, you know, help uh, along that process. Cause uh, that's one of those things it's, it's, daily activity is going to be a constant that your body's going to end up adapting to anyway. So that's, that's something that's like, you got to kind of, you know, take that into consideration along with your training program as well. I've never had a client ever, 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 uh, do too much walking. So, uh, I, I, you could pretty much, as long as you're being fed, you know, and getting adequate macronutrients, you're hitting your, your, your basic macronutrient targets, um, I 99.9% .9 yeah, of the time. Most people don't walk enough. Right. I'm, I'm yeah, advising, usually the I, I'm advising more walks, more walks, more walks, take more walks, especially at a time right now with, with COVID and most people being in mm -hmm. shelter in place. So, uh, it, it would be really tough uh, to, to overdo, uh, something like this. Yeah. For me personally, and I, always, I like resistance training. It's my favorite form of exercise. In other words, you know, my goals, they change, but what do I like the most? Right. I like to be strong. I like to feel like I have some muscle on my body. And I have found for me that the ideal amount of steps every single day to accomplish that is anywhere between twelve to 14,000 a day. Most people don't even get half of that, right? And that's mm -hmm. for me who's, who always likes to be strong and muscular. If my goal was endurance or stamina, um, it would be a lot more than that. So just to give you a little bit of a reference you know, in, in terms of my personal goals. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides, resources, and books. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find Adam at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me at Mind Pump Sal.